Welcome to Talk South Asian to Me. My name is Michelle. And my name is Anusha. Tune in every Thursday at 5 p.m. Central and hear us react to each other's stories about mental health and growing up in different South Asian households. And remember, this podcast is not therapy. Engage with what feels entertaining and resonates with you and leave what doesn't. All righty, let's begin. So, today's alphabet was H. <laughs> So we decided on H for high achievers and the impact Ooh. it has on our mental health. Ah. <laughs> I think I know, I right? This is something I love it. I love it. Very <laughs> apt and appropriate. <laughs> this is something that I think we can all at one point in our life definitely like connect with, you know? I know. High I can. achievement is <laughs> oh yeah, it's grilled into us like it success is. and A's and just everything. <laughs> and God so, forbid B's. <laughs> mm, right? No B's. Like, B is a failure, Michelle. What are you saying? <laughs> no, ma'am. Not okay. I know. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so today to start off our researchy portion, I think you're going to know most of this information, but I'm still going to be curious of like how much of this you knew, if anything surprised you. Okay. So. You'll have a pop quiz at the end, FYI. <laughs> oh, oh. Should I be taking notes? Uh, no. I think so. <laughs> and I don't like pop quizzes. I, who does? <laughs> who likes okay. pop quizzes? Push. <laughs> uh huh. Okay. I'm ready, I think. So I don't know if I'll get an A on the pop quiz. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> High achievement. <laughs> Boo. I'm kidding. <laughs> so to start with, I will start with psychology today. Very reputable. There is a yes. um, PhD, Dr. Karen Hall, who okay. published an article September 9th of 2022. And she talks no. about, this isn't particular to the South Asian community, but she talks about generally um, high achievement and the role it plays on like mental health. So we'll talk about okay. the general first, and then I'll kind of transition to South Asian Perfect. in particular. Sounds beautiful. So, the key points of this article that she writes, though, can be summed up into like three things. One, okay. it's that high achievers have a rate of ha have a high rate of depression. And mm. they often also suffer from anxiety. And sometimes mm. that can even lead to substance abuse. <sighs> yeah, two, so unfortunate. I know. And two, um, high achievers who tend to really identify with their work and like make it their identity more or less and like attach their self-worth to it it often leads them to feel very out of balance within their own life you know mm -hmm. work-life balance it mm -hmm. leads them to have a harder time setting and enforcing their boundaries with work yes. and others in general um it also increases their sense of loneliness and inevitably burnout. Mm. As yeah. you're listing all those things, like the facts, I'm like, check, check, check. All the things I struggle with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I imagine yeah. a lot of us have at least, you know, like I said, at one point or the other, definitely struggled with these things. Yeah. It's hard. The third thing, uh, the third, like, main key point of this article was to talk about how sometimes like high achievement can sometimes go hand in hand with mm. maladaptive perfectionism and Ooh. maladaptive perfectionism can contribute to unhappiness whether or not the success is like success or not you know because it's like subjective mm. right so yeah basically like that maladaptive perfectionism the high achievement makes you think that nothing you accomplish is enough You'll mm. always be thinking, I'm not enough. I'm not doing enough. I got to do more. I got to do more. Mm. No matter how much you accomplish. So there's really no yeah. end game here. So it's an unending vicious cycle that you just can't get out of. Not great. So I will also talk a little bit about some of the other pieces of the article that really stood out to me. Okay. One was okay. um, she talks about how resilience is often seen as an asset, right? We think of resilience as a pretty positive word. But sometimes when we preach like this 
compliments and like, wow, you're so resilient. That's amazing. You've, you've endured so much and you're still going. When we really praise those kinds of behaviors, sometimes people who already feel that pressure, it. yeah, it reinforces this idea of they need to just keep going, put their head down and just yeah. keep trying. They need to be yeah. resilient. And if they stop or seek help, then they're weak, right? Mm. But does that mean that resilience itself is a bad thing? No. I think there's a, a balance here, right? I think we need to embrace the idea of the and. You know, resilience is a wonderful thing. That's amazing you did it. And it doesn't mean you don't need to seek help. It doesn't mean yes. you don't need to also rest and just mm -hmm. embrace and appreciate your accomplishments without, you know, trying to keep going and keep climbing that ladder. Yeah. Yeah. I really, I really like the, I'm just like backtracking a little bit. Like I hmm. feel like the maladaptive perfectionism, those words that you use, I've never heard those two words together. Yeah. And that was so interesting to me. Like yeah, maladaptive I, perfectionism. I like that too. Yeah, like yeah. it really puts things into pers per perspective. Because like, mm -hmm. you hear those words a lot, right? The perfectionist words like, oh, I'm just a perfectionist. Or I'm, yeah. I'm doing this because I'm a perfectionist. Or, yeah. you know, this is how I am. But maladaptive yeah. perfectionism sheds a new light, like not all types of perfectionism or even perfectionism yeah. is not healthy. You know? Right, right. And I, I like the yeah. way th – these are Karen Hall's words, not mine, the maladaptive mm -hmm. perfectionism. But when I read it too, like that kind of struck me out too because we do yeah. usually just hear perfectionist, perfectionism. We don't hear it being maladaptive, which it yes. can be, right? I yeah. think everything is on a spectrum for me. I see everything on a spectrum. So perfectionism can be something like, oh, I'm trying to do it the best I can to be as perfect as I can. That's healthy mm -hmm. enough. But it becomes mm -hmm. maladaptive when it becomes, I just, I need to do more. I need to do more. I'm not doing it. This isn't good enough. I need to keep trying. This just isn't working. Like when you fixate on something. Yes. Or you fixate. kind of on the other end of it almost, when you don't even allow yourself to do it and try or you procrastinate because your fear of failure and it's not going to be perfect. So why do it anyway? Exactly. There's a lot wrapped up in this, for sure. This, yeah, it's pretty heavy. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know, yeah, so for sure. So many layers, so many layers. Exactly. And I have a couple more layers to add. <laughs> Ooh, so okay, I'm ready. Other things that stood out to me in the article was when she mentioned that oftentimes high achievers tend to, because of the resilient piece in particular, they try and maintain this image of high achievement um, and perfection. But doing that means you're kind of putting a mask on, right? You're you're not really being vulnerable. You're not really letting anyone see you because you see it as mm -hmm. it's, it's weak. I'm not supposed to do that. I need to be resilient, which mm -hmm. means it's a barrier, another barrier to seeking the help that you might need to seeking yes. support even, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and if you don't get that support and you kind of – continue down that path where it can lead to often is comparisons, right? Mm -hmm. If you're overachieving and you have this like perfectionism and you feel like you need to be resilient, then you eventually start comparing yourself to other people. And that is never yeah. a good thing because never. you can't compare two people. You just, you can't. Yeah. So when yeah. you do, they're critical. They have negative self-talk like we talked about fear of that failure, right? Mm -hmm. So they're really focusing on all the things that they aren't or other people are accomplishing rather than focusing on that and of, okay, I'm not quite where I want to be, but I'm also mm -hmm. accomplishing X, Y, Z. You don't really see that healthy balance. You only see, I haven't done this. I haven't done that. I'm not doing enough. And that can feel really suffocating and like you're stuck yeah. in this rut that you can't get out of because sometimes yes. – I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but like I have, like sometimes you get so used to that habit of doing that, that mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. you kind of like it's attach annoying. your identity. Yes. I am a high achiever. Yes. I am one with that. So if I'm suddenly not achieving high, if I'm suddenly okay of letting some things go, first of all, how do I do that? Second of all, mm -hmm. so what am I then? Yeah. My, um, there's one other thing I'll mention real quick. So this is more on the South Asian side of this, although okay. I feel like this is generic one too 
pretty much ticked off all the boxes. Yes. Um, yeah. So NAMI, which is, um, or I call it NAMI. I don't know if it's actually called NAMI or NAMI. <laughs> um, I say all acronyms is cute little mm-hmm. words. So NAMI, yeah. which is National <laughs> Alliance on Mental Illness, okay. um, they offered a similar perspective on their website. Um, for South Asians in particular. So this is their direct quote. Oh, wow. Quote. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, their direct quote was, achievement expectations for children of AAPI immigrant parents often grow up hearing explicit or implied messages that their parents made a lot of sacrifices for them to be in this country and that the mm. family's future depends on their hard work and achievements. This pressure to achieve can create a deep sense of obligation and burden Mm. and ultimately have a significant impact on mental health, potentially contributing to a higher rate of suicidal thoughts among Asian American college students compared to their white peers. Wow. That's heavy. Also, what a, like, it's a huge burden. That's true. Like, Mm -hmm. no child no student no person should ever feel that responsibility and bear that burden like no how how unfortunate and how saddening and disappointing yeah yeah and sometimes that is the truth though just you know especially if we're talking about like socioeconomically like sometimes it does fall on children to bear that burden that responsibility of being adults so young and like taking on the responsibility to achieve more than maybe their parents so that they can not just like provide for themselves because all parents most most parents will say Mm -hmm. we want better for you than we had right but then to take it a step further and say no no we depend on it too this isn't just for you this is for us yeah and then of course like if you're the oldest sibling i'm sure that makes a difference right oh yeah Mm -hmm. there's just so many more layers to it like you have these responsibilities at such a young age that you never asked for yeah you were just born you don't get a choice in that Mm -hmm. yeah so mini pop quiz what does (laughs) here we go only one question so it's a pass or fail (laughs) Ah, so much pressure i know it's like literally like all no uh, zero or a hundred percent that's all i get yeah that's it and no curve sorry (laughs) <laughs> no bell curve. I feel like it's a very appropriate for our conversation today. <laughs> so I love it. Are you ready? Drum roll, please. Yes. yes. Okay. The question is our topic. So high achievement and the impact on mental health. What is the what are some examples of the impact on mental health for high achievers? Um <laughs> rates of anxiety, depression maladaptive perfectionism yeah yeah i know you really connected to that <laughs> there you go you got a hundred i get a hundred percent yeah <laughs> the high achiever is not i'm still nice. getting rid of it's like wow well, high five <laughs> i know right i think i just enabled that mm, i don't know how i feel about that <laughs> so okay, Backtracking. At, least realized, at least we realized yes so we're awareness aware is key. awareness <laughs> is key there you go yeah so, so you take a moment Tell that part yes. of you be like, we achieve, we feel good, but you know what? It's okay if we got it wrong. It's okay too. if I got a zero. Yeah, it's okay yeah. if I had a zero. <laughs> it just means that Anisha told the story really boringly. It's fine. <laughs> no, it means that Anisha was a great teacher and I was listening and I learned. <laughs> well, if you didn't get it, weren't listening then, but you were. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, so. Do you have anything to add on, like, you know, statistically type of stuff? Any thoughts? Any surprises? No, I mean, I kind of shared what was kind of surprising stuck with me, the maladaptive perfectionism. The maladaptive, but yeah. Mm-hmm. I really liked the way you explained how, for some people, it becomes, like, an identity. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I feel like my story is going to expand that a little bit. But I love that, like, you brought that up. And it's so important to think about it that way because it shouldn't be your identity. So it's, like, yeah. important that – you realize that, oh, this is taking over me, my personal, my professional in my entire mm-hmm. life. And that's not okay. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. um, so, but, you know, I think the statistics weren't really that surprising to me. Yeah. Just because of like, we hear in the news, right? Things that happen in our college campuses, unfortunately, like yeah. this pressure of high achievement does, is something that I think is you're right, isn't just in our South Asian community, yeah. but it's in the broader community. And like what you said, 
the AAPI quote that you shared with mm. us, like it says it's not just this community, mm. it's it's broad scale and it's general yeah. and it is an issue. And I'm sure it kind of maybe impacts or amplified in different ways in South Asian community that we can maybe get into. But unfortunately it wasn't surprising to me. And yeah. It shouldn't be that it shouldn't be this case. That's what I'm saying. Even though it wasn't surprising to his immediate, it's okay. No. But I'm glad that we're sharing these numbers, we're sharing these yeah. this research because it's the first thing is to build awareness. Mm -hmm. That's what we're trying to do here. Yeah. And I, I really love that this has actually been kind of our unexpected theme throughout most of our podcast, yes, which is like yes we might not have received it but we're building awareness we're going to heal and we're going to do differently for the future i love that exactly <laughs> yeah okay are you ready for my story i'm ready <laughs> <laughs> okay so as you can probably remember i was a pretty uh, nerdy ish kid <laughs> your typical your typical you know nerdy brown kid Nerds in the house. <laughs> no broke, no breaking rules. All of that. <laughs> yes. And except for those few times. <laughs> except for the few times. Not for me, for you. <laughs> for me. I was too fearful. Too fearful. Reference to previous podcasts. <laughs> mm -hmm. Go watch a few. Go listen if you haven't. That was a funny one. <laughs> well, actually, it wasn't the previous one. It was the dating one. <laughs> yeah, it was a letter D. That was a few letters ago. A few letters ago. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so... Growing up, um, I I think you can imagine that my family was like most families of the South Asian descent, very much like, yes, A's are good, A's are acceptable, A's are expected, and if you get one, no big deal. If you don't, yeah. what happened here? And a part of that, of course, you know, again, the next step to that is be a doctor, right? So this theme is going to come up a little bit. Mm -hmm. But to share with you a little bit about how I grew up in particular around all of these kinds of expectations, I wasn't allowed to help cook. I wasn't allowed to help do the laundry. Mm -hmm. Simple, like basic chores, like life skills mm -hmm. that kids like have and then complain about. I never got to complain. Yeah. That seems unfair. <laughs> mm -hmm. I yeah, never got to complain that I had chores. And I know that sounds silly to say, but it's true because I didn't have these life skills growing up basic things mm -hmm. mainly because for my parents it was kind of like oh it's a waste of time you don't need to help just go study go use your time to mm -hmm. study and like that was always mm -hmm. like it's a running thing all the time anytime i wanted to do anything else to help you know my parents nothing even like fun it would be don't mm -hmm. worry about it go study don't waste your time mm. so obviously that's not sustainable I, I can't just no, study not. i mean that's yeah. so boring and 100 percent of the time what are you gonna do there's yeah, only so much human. you can study yeah you're a human being <laughs> well yes that and also there is only so much you can study though especially like that's when you're true. younger and like things are oh, this is gonna sound like basic. very nerdy of me this is gonna sound super nerdy but things are a little bit easier <laughs> mm -hmm. right you don't have to study as much so yeah. What I did in secret was I read fiction books all the time. Yeah. And sometimes at night when I should be sleeping, sometimes throughout my entire evening and then quickly doing my homework on the bus. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, it was like there wasn't anything else I was supposed to do. I was expected to be in my room and study. So I was in my room. I just wasn't studying. I was yeah. studying fiction. <laughs> um. So, yeah, that's kind of how I tended to like grow up and that was what it was expected so that I kind of found ways to like work around the expectation yeah make it kind of work for me and then in high school uh we had like AP classes right for the mm -hmm. most part if I remember correctly I think I had pl like plenty of A's but I think I started getting some B's especially one mm -hmm. of those semesters or years where I had like all AP and my parents weren't never like, they were never like um, shaming mm -hmm. or like guilting necessarily, as far as I can remember at least. But I, I was questioned often like, why did you get this grade? What did everyone else get? Like, how did you get such a low grade? Did you not study? 
what can you do about it? How are you going to fix this? What do you need? Because this isn't acceptable. Yeah. We got to do something. But it was never like shame on you. Like I was fortunate enough that I didn't have to actually experience like that. Like you're failing at this. You're sucking at this. Mm -hmm. Like anything kind of cruel. And I have definitely yeah. heard some people who've gone through that, which is why I say like I'm fortunate enough not to have experienced that. Yeah. But the pressure was still there of like, this is unacceptable. You got to fix it. Do something about it. Yeah. And I remember it kind of all like the sphere that I'm talking about that I lived in of like my parents, like knowing anything about like this side of me or anything like that. It really came to a head one time. I remember it's funny now, but it was very scary then. I had, um, do you remember star tests? Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. The, they're still like going the standardized. On. Yeah. yeah, yeah they're I, still going I think on. they are. But I thought they, yeah, they I are. heard they were going to ban star tests and oh, replace it with something. I don't know. I don't know. No. If you know, let us know. Let us know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. But star tests were basically like standardized testing throughout Texas. I don't think anyone yeah. else did it except for Texas. I think um, there was standardized testing, but it wasn't called star, star like other acronyms. Right. They had other ones. Yeah. 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 So there was this one. I think this was fourth or fifth grade. I can't quite remember. Or maybe this was in middle school. I don't know. doesn't matter. Point is, there was a star test that we were taking that wasn't official. It was like a practice run because it was going to count the next year. But this year, they just wanted us to – it was a new one that they were guinea pigging on mm -hmm. us, basically. So it didn't gotcha. count, and I didn't study. And I know everyone says star tests are, like, super easy, but, like, I don't know. I don't remember – all I remember is I failed so hard. <laughs> and because it's it technically harder than didn't a tax. count. Yeah, it was – I remember oh, this. I forgot about tax. They were, it was the year oh, they yeah. were transitioning from tax to star and we were the guinea pigs. Mm. And they, yeah, I remember this okay. very vividly. Yes. Do you remember what star test it was? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe social studies? It was science. It was science. It was science. science. <laughs> okay. Oh, I remember gosh. because – that added to my anxiety because my parents have always been like, be a doctor. Let's go. Let's do this. Med yeah. school. So I was even more tense to tell them like, yeah, oh. I totally failed. Yeah. So what I did though, I hit it for as long as I could. And then when they yeah. asked about it, they were like, hey, you got your other star test. Didn't you have another? I was like, yeah. oh no, since it didn't count, like they didn't really give that out. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, it, it was crumpled at the bottom, like bottom bottom of my backpack with a bunch of stuff on top <laughs> i love it i was just so terrified because i mean that science you were coping stepping stool you were coping to with doctor it, yeah. Yeah. yeah pressure was real and i was i didn't want to find out what would happen when i failed yeah. not even got a b yeah. i failed my yeah. first failing grade and i was terrified so i ended up yeah. not telling them I, I did end up telling them like well into like graduation of college <laughs> mm -hmm. and they were just like wow <laughs> they remember like, it after that long no no i i mentioned like hey this had happened do you remember it and i think they were just like oh no did that happen why didn't you tell us <laughs> but what are they gonna <laughs> do like, i graduated college us? yeah there you go there you yeah. go it's a good way good time to tell them yeah exactly once things are definitely far removed <laughs> exactly um yeah. So that's kind of how I grew up. By the time I got to college, pressure was super ramped up. I, I know people say high school to college transition is hard, but oh my mm -hmm. God, nothing could have prepared me for the absolute whiplash of that experience. Yeah. And I took way too many credits, more than was recommended oh. because I was like, I did AP. I'll totally be okay. I was yeah. not okay. Not yeah. okay. <laughs> I college did too many secret. extracurriculars. Yeah. It's mm. so different. The way you study is different. The way they grade is different. Just yeah. everything is different. I learned it the hard way too. It was hard. hard. I think those of us who've gone to college here for the like first time in our families, I think we kind of experienced that like real shell mm -hmm. shock of the mm -hmm. difference for sure. And eventually, obviously, I, I was in the med school track, right? So I was doing pre-med and I had a bunch of like basic classes you know genetics biology mm -hmm. chem 101 whatever they were and um i think there was like two or three classes i failed i straight up like was failing and oh. i had i think i repeated like or maybe not three classes 
I was near failing and then I actually failed one and then I repeated that one and I was failing it again. And at that point I was like, you know what? This is not happening. I was miserable. Mm -hmm. I was anxious. I was depressed. I was, I was just like in constant unhappiness and loneliness and like, no one Mm -hmm. gets it. I'm not doing enough. Everyone's doing fine. This is me problem that, you know, as you know, that compounding with all the other health stuff I had going on. I went mm-hmm. to therapy and like that was one of the big things that we talked through in therapy it was like this expectation and this fear of disappointing my parents mm-hmm. and like this fear of failing. Yeah. And through, you know, that therapy experience on campus, like I finally realized like, you know what, this is just not sustainable because this is not something I want. I can keep taking it. I'm just going to keep failing. Like, why am I doing mm-hmm. this to myself? So yeah. I remember I eventually put my foot down called my parents. I said, look, I am changing my major. I know what I want to do. I've known all along. You didn't listen before. I am not going to do this anymore. I'm doing psychology, period. I'm going to be a therapist, yes. period. I know it. This is Woo-hoo. happening. Yeah. Oh, my, goodness, yeah. So proud oh of my God. I was so terrified. I was literally shaking. Oh. It was terrifying because it was the first time that I made such like a big decision and that they didn't approve of. You said a boundary. boundary huge Mm. boundary i've never set a boundary before never anything like that in particular wow and that's big so proud yeah thank you i'm proud of little me too (laughs) yeah and granted you know because it was such a new thing for like on both ends like my parents and me they weren't very happy about it they were very confused they were not not necessarily angry but more so like so concerned and fearful of like what that would mean not being a doctor not making more money than them Mm -hmm. because you know they were like we want you to do even better than us we want you to make more money than us we want you to be more successful than us and that's what they need they were like be a doctor why aren't you doing it i should have put you on like that eight year eight year like med program instead of four four and i was like okay (laughs) (laughs) um but eventually eventually they let i was just like sticking you know my boots in the ground and be like no no Mm -hmm. i i understand you're mad but i don't know i don't care what happens in the future i'm telling you this is what i'm going to be good at i know it i feel it and so they were like okay you can try and eventually like now they're proud of me (laughs) for choosing what i'm good at and loving it especially and hopefully they see like you're happy that's what matters exactly exactly yeah yeah Exactly. Although I'm pretty sure underneath that happiness, there's still a faint hope that I'll be a doctor. (laughs) Mm. Even now. And I know like, oh my gosh, my dad has actually said on several occasions, you know, you could still get a PhD. And I'm like, that PhD will not serve me in the least. I am a business and a therapist. I do not teach in the way like a PhD yeah. candidate would teach. And I'm like, I don't need it. And he's like, exactly. yeah, but you could be called a doctor. I was like, no. Oh, he wants the title. No. Mm. Yeah. I was like, that <laughs> if you want, you can call me that if you want, but I'm not. <laughs> Please don't tell people. <laughs> <laughs> you can call it to me secretly. <laughs> yes. But yeah, you know, I think that was my experience with like, high achievement and like being Mm. you know basically pressured into high achieving is in the beginning it was very normal it was kind of like Mm -hmm. okay yeah this is what's expected of me this is what i'm supposed to do okay yeah makes sense i didn't really question it and i found ways to like work around it to make it work for me because i was too young to see boundaries modeled i was too young to understand that i can have different opinions and do different things but eventually as with a lot of things, if we deny ourselves our truth long enough, it catches up to you. And it did. It caught up to me in a very (laughs) explosive way. I've Mm -hmm. mentioned this so many times in our podcast, like that college moment, that therapy, because so many things really intersected into that moment. Mm -hmm. But it was such a transformational, important thing to happen. And I'm glad it did. It was a canon event. Spider-Man reference. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Wait, what is the reference? I don't know. Have you seen the new Spider-Man movie? You have oh, to see it. The... No, don't tell okay. me. No, I want to see it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> once you once you watch it, and then you can hear this line again, you'll be like, "Oh, okay. that's what Michelle meant." <laughs> I'll come back to it, and then I'll I'll call you. And be like, I can't. I don't want to give you spoilers. <laughs> yeah, no, don't. <laughs> okay, but no, you're right. Like that moment, I feel like a lot of us have that moment, those few moments that we will never forget. That kind of yeah. was a domino effect for us. 
that oh, kind yeah. of set the tone for the rest of our healing journey. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So that was my experience. Yeah. I have since found a way, like you said, through that healing moment that happened then of being able to find my balance. Still wasn't easy, especially through like grad school because I was loving what I was doing and I was acing it for lack mm-hmm. of a better term. It kind of started feeding that piece of me of like high achievement, like, yes, I can do more. And it did take a lot of effort because I was also training to be a therapist. I had to be like, wait, yes. wait. No, no, balance. We need balance. There you so go. So I had to kind of, even while accomplishing the things I wanted to accomplish, I had to find ways to seek out that balance and be like, you know what? This isn't where my self worth is tied to, though. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Beautiful. Thanks for sharing your journey about it. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's so interesting how it's such a common theme, but everybody has like a different perspective about high achievement Mm -hmm. and experience um do you feel like this is kind of a heavy question so you don't have to answer this if you don't want to but do you feel like that high achieving part of yourself still comes out or you still feel like it's there in some points Mm. in time even till today do you feel like that oh yeah Mm -hmm. yeah oh yeah for sure i feel like it's a lot more tame because once I found that balance and I found my happiness within that balance, I didn't really look back. That's always felt like really strong to my core. And I've practiced that for kind of a couple of years now, I want to say. So it's really like honed in there. Honed down. It's dimmed. Mm -hmm. It's dimmed. Exactly. It's a perfect way to put it. It's dimmed, but it exists. And sometimes it'll come up, but it'll come up in a dimmed way. It won't like be shouting and screaming at me anymore it'll just be like this kind of voice at the back of my head of like what are you doing you're not doing enough you should do it's kind of like merged now with my imposter syndrome oh okay yeah gotcha yeah but manageable manageable yeah that's so good that's huge progress from where it started so that's amazing so proud of you. oh yeah it's been a journey (laughs) yes i love it now Um, i want to hear about your story yes okay (laughs) So I'm going to kind of, the way my experience I want to kind of share with it is I'm going to start kind of like the origin I feel like it came started and then kind Mm -hmm. of two pivotal experiences in my life when it it comes to talking about being a high achiever. And Mm -hmm. I feel like there's another word for high achiever. Mm -hmm. It's not people pleaser. It could be people pleaser, but... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the origins of high achievement can be people pleasing people pleasing <laughs> exactly i don't know i'll hmm. think of it maybe later but okay. <laughs> so um i feel like my origin era of high achieving <laughs> is a little bit different i feel like than yours mm-hmm. okay. so i feel like i've mentioned this in previous podcast episodes too where I felt like growing up, I didn't get the most consistent um, and unconditional attention from Mm -hmm. my parents. And so it kind of felt like I did get that love that I really wanted or the most amount of love that I received was when I was high achieving, Mm -hmm. when I was a student of the month, when I was like first in class in grades or my report Mm -hmm. card had all A's, right? Like it was reinforced the high achievement. And so I learned mm. to be a high achiever in that way and mm-hmm. took pride in it. And working hard, like being the hardest worker became my norm. And fortunately, I was privileged that being a high achiever came easy in, like in school yeah. for me. So even though it took a lot of – it took a toll on me later in life. Like in the moment, it mm-hmm. felt like it came easy to me in that time and day, right. like in grade school. Right. And, and, like, um, and kind of when I hit college is when similar to your experience, like mm-hmm. it was kind of like a slap in the face, like, oh, like, <sighs> yeah, it's mm-hmm. not always going to be easy and high achievement is not always going to be there. So I was also pre-med and mm-hmm. I took this class, the infamous OCHEM, Organic chemistry. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, like, oh, I still get God. triggered by talking yeah, about I, it. I failed oh, Kim. I took it twice. <laughs> yes. Didn't know so, anything oh about it. Oh, my gosh, times. you took it twice. Yeah, I <laughs> took it once. 
And I was on the border of passing and failing. It did not come easy to me. And it was a huge mm-hmm. surprise. And I know that sounds, I feel like, a little shallow. But like up until that point, I wasn't yeah. challenged that way. And right? it was really, really hard for me to overcome that challenge because I hadn't experienced that before. And because I had the high achievement so tethered to my parents' mm. approval and to yeah. my love for, to, for their love for me. Mm. And so it was really, really hard. And, and it wasn't to say like my parents kind of reprimanded me for not doing well in school or mm. not doing well in college. Like I think I created this idea in my mind too because I do remember talking to them about not doing well in OCHEM or not doing well. Mm. And they were, I will say like, say like, it's okay. Like, don't worry about it. Like they would try to like, yeah. tell me like it's okay but I think at by that point too like I was so engrossed in this yeah. high achiever identity like we talked about in the beginning like right. even those words yeah. didn't mean anything to me like I needed mm-hmm. even for like my relationship to myself also became wrapped up with this idea of being mm-hmm. a high achiever my self-worth yeah. became defined like was defined by being a high achiever and so when this organic chemistry time course came around and I wasn't doing well and I was having rough mm-hmm. nights, sleepless nights with puffy eyes in the morning, right? Like puffy oh. night, like, you know, all yeah. this, all these struggles with this course, yeah. I started feeling like a failure and started, like we, you said, like comparing myself to others, comparing to the other high achievers in my class and saying, mm-hmm. why am I not getting this course? Why is this so hard for me? Even though I'm doing yeah. all these office hours, I'm doing all of this. Like I can't, I just can't get it. Mm-hmm. And it almost became like a reality that like, oh, like perfectionism isn't real. Like I cannot be perfect mm-hmm. at every, everything. And that's the reality mm-hmm. or like that's the reality. Like perfectionism isn't real. And, you, and so I – Like you were just so fed up with it. Like you came to that place of like, you know what? Well, it wasn't like possible. right away. Yeah, it wasn't right away, but I was starting to like, you know, accept it like Huh. And it wasn't, I think, as active as another experience later in my life I'm going to talk about. But like mm. that was also a pivotal point for me too where I changed my major. I switched to human development mm. family sciences. You know, yeah. go, go. I was still pre-med at that time but just switched the major and kind of accepted right. the C in that class and moved mm. on. Like I kind of just accepted it. I don't think I really worked through like the maladaptive perfectionism that I had. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah. I kind of just ex- – kind of worked through it in the moment, accepted it and moved on because once I switched my major, the Mm -hmm. high achiever personality and identity in me was reinforced again because once I switched my major, I was like doing better in my classes. I started doing better. I think it was like mental health related too. Like, you know what they say, like when you're enjoying what you're doing, you tend to do better at it. You tend to work harder at it. Mm -hmm. So because once I switched my major, I was enjoying my classes more. I was taking child development classes and all these play classes that I loved. And so I think that carried over to my pre-med classes and I started doing better in those. Mm. So again, like, I was like, oh, it's probably just because I didn't like that class. You know, like I just thought of it that way. Like it was just a one-off thing. And I just kept going about my day, going about undergrad. And I like graduated undergrad with still the mindset I'm going to be a doctor, but decided to take that two-year gap and did teaching for those two years. Mm -hmm. And so that next experience experience number two with this topic high achievement and like the biggest kind of test slash like I think this was the pivotal experience the like biggest Mm. pivotal experience was Mm -hmm. my time as a teacher um and so during my first year teaching so the teaching program that I was in was very like quick and fast it wasn't the typical teaching route that you would do when you're an undergrad and I just did summer training mm-hmm. and then I was kind of put in the classroom with 30 30 students right away like by myself oh, wow. I mean yeah. I had coaches but it wasn't like I was never really a student teacher like and it wasn't like in a classroom with another teacher like um, mm-hmm. and only in the summer so the first six months were so brutal I taught a middle mm-hmm. school grade um <sighs> Yeah, it's a hard and, grade to teach. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Nobody wants to remember the middle school years either, right? Oh so, God, no! <laughs> it's just awkward. This is weird, awkward years. And I was a new mm-hmm. teacher. I was still learning how to be a teacher. I feel like the training was good, but I feel like I, mm-hmm. th- I was still doing on the job training. I felt like I was still learning during yeah, that for first sure. year. Plus, so the like, first th- that's the age people are kind of mean. <laughs> Yeah, it's just true. It is exactly coming so into their can hormones. Can you just imagine this person like coming no, out of college? You poor going, thing. Yay! I'm gonna teach. I know. I know. And then we have these middle schoolers. Mm-hmm. So those, you know, those 
first six months were rough and I was teaching a test, a subject like we talked about, a, a standardized test. And teachers are unfortunately are numbered by their test scores. And so I wasn't looking mm. great in front of my leadership. My classroom management mm. was poor. And again, I wasn't automatically yeah. good at it right away. So yeah, ding, ding, ding. My high achiever person, that person inside me was like, what oh. are you doing? Like, what's happening? Oh, no. And because I hadn't worked through it fully, like I was still in that mindset, like perfectionism. And again, mm -hmm. kind of took that dip in my mental health a little bit. And I was having a rough yeah. time. Like I was just upset all the time. I was giving myself a hard, hard time. I was telling myself I'm a failure, looking, like, looking at that in a very, very bad way. And I learned again that um, high achievement is not always possible. And I feel like mm. this time around, it was like, no, this is like not even school anymore. This is a career, you know? Mm. And to be fair, like I did have to make – like I worked with my coaches. Like it was to the point where like, these poor scores weren't looking good and like I got ultimatums yeah. for my leadership. Like it was not Oof. looking great for me. Yeah. Mm. And um, I was not okay. But I'm so thankful to my coaches at that time. Like they were really supportive. Mm. And I had a lot of professional and personal growth to like do better and I was able to do that with their support but I did have to make some changes like I worked with my coaches I made sure to give myself grace mm -hmm. and then Good. actually it's some, my role kind of changed too like the subjects that I was teaching teaching so like with all those changes mm -hmm. like I did got I did get some success thankfully and I was I was okay Good. like my role was okay and I was like I was still there mm -hmm. um but it helped me like not being good at it automatically, but also having to make those shifts and not being like perfect at it right away and, and telling myself like, oh, after these shifts, after these changes, I'm okay. I did better. That helped me mm -hmm. realize that, okay, this isn't for me, not only because I didn't love it to the max, but also because maybe I'm not yeah. good at it either. And that is okay. And yeah. that was a huge pivotal moment of me realizing, okay, I'm not a high achiever in everything and that's mm. okay. Yeah. And and it was like like what I said in the beginning like yes I use this kind of ex high achieving mindset connected to my parents and it was in some way right like I wasn't doing mm. well my parents were concerned at with me and they were actually concerned with more of my mental health. Like I remember my mom, like make sure this doesn't lead to a nervous breakdown. Like she was actually like concerned mm. for me. Mm, of um, course. But again, it was so engrossed in how I was raised and how I thought about myself mm. that even though it was like those concerns that my parents did have about me more about my mental health at that time didn't mean much because I was so like engrossed and wanting to be the best. That and, identity fusion. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But mm. I think realizing that, and finishing that first year teaching and then going into my second year and doing better, enjoying my second year. But I still like was like, I I want whatever I want to do, I want to be the best at. Not and I also mm. want to enjoy it. And these two things are not hit are not here for me. Like I'm I'm not I'm not yeah. th not the best, but like, you know, a trajectory or feel like I can grow. And I yeah. felt like I wasn't growing or I wasn't doing better and it was it wasn't something I'm passionate about. And so mm -hmm not actually not being or being okay with it being okay with not being a high achiever in this career mm. helped me make the transition to the career I am so excited and happy about today mm. right yeah but it took this these moments and this time period in my life that I would say is one of my lowest times in my life to yeah. wow. like make that change yeah so I don't regret yeah. any of it but it was really hard like even to think back like I have friends that did this teaching program with me that are now in med school. They're mm -hmm. doctors. I have friends that are lawyers. And mm -hmm. they say too that this teaching program, this teaching experience was harder than like going to mm -hmm. med school, going to law school, wow. being a drug. And so, yeah, yeah, like a lot of people attribute not their only their professional growth, but also their personal growth. And I think this is where my personal growth came in too in this time mm -hmm. period of being a teacher. Yeah. Um, so it's just so surreal that this idea of high achievement was planted in my mind at a, such a young age and it just carried mm -hmm. on for such a long time and how much yeah. it was reinforced through affirmations that were given to me only when right. I did well in school and then right. not when I – like when I didn't do well in school, it wasn't like 
there was no affirmations. It was just like a little bit of disappointment or like, you know, it wasn't like, mm-hmm. again, like you said, I was privileged to not have like those brutal, severe punishments mm-hmm. of like not doing well in school. But like I did deal with some disappointment, which did take a toll. Yeah. It was like a cycle, right? Like I became a high achiever. So I'm trying to avoid disappointment. And when disappointment happened, I get more disappointed in myself. And then again, I'm trying to be mm-hmm. a high achiever to avoid that disappointment. It's like exactly. a cycle. And this Absolutely. burden and responsibility about having to always be this A plus student in every part of my life, right? Like whether it's school, whether it's my career, whether it's the roles I'm playing in my life, an A plus sister, an A plus daughter, mm. an A plus yeah. girlfriend, you know, A plus friend. Yeah. Like this carried over is high achievement yeah. me achieving like need in me carries over in so much in yeah. all aspects of my life. And it's not mm-hmm. realistic. And it has so oh, much yeah. repercussions like we talked about. And so like you said, like, like what you ex- shared that it does come up, it's dimmed. Like I think it, it is dimmed for me, but probably not mm-hmm. as dimmed as I want to be. Like I'm still trying to dim it. It's still there. Um, mm-hmm. I think the high achievement is, is connected to comparing yourself to others. So like that's still something I'm working on myself. And I know we talked in the beginning of other long-term impacts, like work boundaries mm-hmm. and work-life balance. Yeah. Like those are things I'm like, you know, still on my way on working on. And I think it's because I'm this recovering high achiever. There you go. Another term. (laughs) Yeah. There it is. There it is. So that's kind of my experience about it. I I knew that, you know, like the teaching experience you had was a difficult one, but my goodness, I didn't realize like how difficult it was and like what a toll it took on you. Yeah, it did. That's it crazy. Took, it spilled over in all my relationships. Mm. Like yeah. I yeah, sure. was not able to be like the sister I wanted to be, the daughter I wanted to be. I wasn't able to yeah. give time to my friends and family. I lost friendships. Yeah. You know, like mm. it It was not a good time. Um, yeah. But it was an important time. Yeah. yeah Because it absolutely. helped me. It helped me see – myself in a different way in a better way yeah yeah I hear that you know sometimes our choices lead us down these like difficult like bottom points and when we're in it it sucks nobody wants Mm -hmm. to be there but sometimes I won't generalize and say always sometimes it is what we need in order Mm -hmm. to recognize that there's a problem be aware of it start practicing hard truths and then come out of that place into where we're actually meant to be. Exactly. Sometimes it's exactly what we need. Sometimes. Exactly. Yeah. I don't want to generalize. There's lots of reasons when that would be a shitty thing to say. So exactly. (laughs) But I I really love too, like how you said, it's not just about like high achievement is it's not exclusive to like academic and career. It's also in relationships. And I think you're totally right. You know, sometimes we, Especially like if you're talking about like people pleasing and high achievement, high achievement. it becomes like a super powered um, tendency to like want to be very helpful, very accommodating, mm-hmm. very flexible, very anything that serves that person because Except we you. feel good mm-hmm. about it. Exactly. Exactly. It's a vacuum. We f- super vacuum. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I want to call it. High achieving super people pleaser is like a super vacuum. It super takes away vacuum. everything from you. <laughs> it does though, especially in the long term. If you're not very like balanced about it, it really can, right? I mean, it can yeah. lead to the exact opposite of what you want. It can lead to resentment. It can lead to that mm-hmm. relationship like totally just going off the rails in the wrong direction. All because we didn't balance, and it's like you when you when you combine high achievement to love it's hard even in relationships mm-hmm. because you're like mm-hmm. if i fail at this they're not gonna love me anymore and yeah. the fear of abandonment comes in in that mm. if i'm not being the best daughter yeah. or if i'm not being the best girlfriend mm. at all times every single minute of my life and like you yeah. know i'm not allowed to make mistakes i'm not allowed to fail yeah. they're gonna leave me you know like yeah it's real like mm. high achievement I absolutely think, can carry over in all places of life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, I really do like that you pointed that out too, because I, I think that 
that's something that we hadn't talked about earlier today. Mm -hmm. and, and it's that, that sometimes we can equate high achievement or anything, but like people pleasing, high achievement, whatever. We can equate those things to love. If we high achieve, we receive love. If we yeah. don't, we don't receive love. Because, I mean, that is when, like you said, like, yeah. it's reinforced by parental attention, parental validation, parental encouragement, parental mm -hmm. pride. All of those things are reinforced when we achieve or when we people please and do what someone wants. So then we, like you said earlier, right, you embed that as a part of like, okay, so this is what I need to do to get these things then, to get the attention, to get the love. Exactly. Exactly. And that can just create this vicious cycle. Yes. Mm, hard stuff to talk hard about. Stuff. And yeah, but important. I feel like absolutely very important to be at least aware of all of these things so that mm -hmm. we can start our journeys in healing. We can feel like we're not alone in this, that other people go through things similarly. And exactly. Also, last bonus, we don't pass it on. Yeah. It stops with us. Yes. Yeah. All right. Any last thoughts before we close out? Yeah, just we would love to hear from you all if you're listening, you're watching, yeah. and if you resonate with anything or you would like to share your own story and experience, please reach out to us. If you can email us at talksouthasiantome at gmail.com. <laughs> and then yes. any social media plat platform, our handle is at talksouthasiantome. We would love to hear from you. Yeah, your stories, your experiences. If this really resonates, I imagine most of the people it will. <laughs> Hopefully. But, you know, or if anything if we missed sharing, even too. Yes, yes. And your stories matter to us. We would love to hear them. Yeah. Yes. All right. Alrighty. See you next time. See you next time. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye.